Hi folks, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech and in this video we're going to look at linearity and superposition. The motivation for this is biased by a control system design perspective and that is in order to chart a good path for your control system design it's nice if you know if this system is linear or nonlinear. Also, a lot of systems in nature are nonlinear, but a lot of times we can design control systems based on a linearized model. So again, it's just good to know if your system is linear or not. We're going to explore, perhaps review, superposition related to differential equation models for dynamic systems. And then you will be able to take a differential equation model and determine if it's linear or nonlinear using the concept of superposition. It boils down to just four steps. And if you apply those four steps every time, you can certainly determine if your differential equations are linear or nonlinear. And then we'll use MATLAB and Simulink to uh, explore or experimentally probe linearity of a dynamic system. It all boils down to this. A dynamic system is linear if and only if it satisfies superposition. The IFF is the if and only if thing. Um, that's it. And to understand what superposition is, to play around with it, we have to define a little bit of notation. I'm going to use U for inputs, Y for outputs, and I'll use the little right arrow to either mean implies or produces, and you'll see what I mean in just a minute. We'll use this mass spring damper system just to give ourselves something to think about when we're talking about superposition. So we have the old mass attached to a vertical support by a damper and a spring, and it's sliding on some mythical frictionless uh, horizontal surface. And there's the differential equation for it, where u is really a force input and y is the displacement of the mass. Now we're going to take that stinker and apply three experiments to it. The first experiment is we'll just pick a U1 out of the air, it could be a sine wave or an e to the negative t or whatever, and we'll apply that force to the mass and we'll measure the response y and we'll call that input U1 and the response that we measure y1. We'll pick another input, something different preferably, and we'll call that U2, we'll apply it to the mass and we'll measure some y2. And we'll do just one last experiment where we take the two inputs that we just used, the u1 and the u2, and we'll multiply them by some scalars. We can pick anything we want, alpha 1 and alpha 2, those are the scalars. We'll sum the, those two quantities together, that'll give us a new u, apply it to the mass, and we'll get a new response, and we'll call that y3. So great, we have our three sets of experimental data, and so now what we're going to do is determine if the system is linear. And now you can't really determine if a system is linear via experiments. I'm just using that to get the you know the juices flowing, so to speak. If y3 that we measured is identically equal to alpha 1 y1 plus alpha 2 y2, then that system is linear. And we can turn that around the other way, and that's the if and only if part of this. That is, if the system is linear, then you can be absolutely guaranteed that if you do these experiments, that Y3, the data that you acquired in that third experiment, is going to be equal to the alpha 1 times Y1 plus the alpha 2 times Y2. You can think of this another way, and here we'll exercise our arrow notation. Think of the arrow sort of as the dynamic system itself. So if you give a the the dynamic system is U, uh, U1, it produces Y1. If you give it U2, it produces Y2. The system is linear if, when you form yet another input, alpha1 U1 plus alpha2 U2, and you run it through the dynamic system, that's our right arrow, you get alpha1 Y1 plus alpha2 Y2. And you have to be able to do that for any constants alpha1 and alpha2. So let's look at some examples. Here's the first one. It's our mass spring damper differential equation model. And we're going to break this down into just four steps. So the first thing you do is you assume linearity. We're going to say that here's our input u. And it's equal to the sum of the u1 and the u2. And it produces y. And that is the sum of the y1 and the y2. The second step is we combine, we, we substitute in equation 2 into equation 1. And in order to do that, we definitely will have to take some derivatives, right? Because we have this y double dot here, and we have a y here. So we have to take a couple derivatives, stab it in there, take one derivative, stab it in there, take this into there, this into there. And 
you just do all those substitutions and you get this great big equation four. Now I put a question mark over the equality because what we're now going to do is play around with that expression. And if that expression holds, then the system is linear. This equation four is sort of a statement of the superposition. Now I should also mention that at this point I'm not going to be showing the dependency, the explicit dependency on time anymore. That just, you know, you start getting these very large expressions that way and I just want to get rid of that. So what we're going to do next is play around with that expression just a little bit and specifically we're going to rearrange it so that we separate out all the things that are multiplied by alpha 1 and all the things that are multiplied by alpha 2. And if we can show that this expression holds for any alpha 1, alpha 2, that system is linear. So here's equation 4 again, and I've multiplied it all out and regrouped it so that I have these quantities in the square brackets multiplied by alpha 1 and the quantities here in the square brackets multiplied by alpha 2. And if that expression is equal to zero, the system is linear. And the only way that I'm going to be able to have that equal to zero for any u1, y1 combinations, and any alpha 1, alpha 2, is if the quantities in the square brackets are identically zero. That's a crazy thing because the y1s and the u1s, they're all functions of time. So when you combine all those up, they have to be identically equal to zero. And if that happens, then the system is linear. Well, guess what? We have our original differential equation that we know holds for any u1 and it produces a y1. So that's this differential equation. So in particular, I can write out these two differential equations for the u1 and the u2, and they bear a remarkable resemblance to the quantities in the square brackets. I can replace these three terms with this and I get a u1 minus a u1. And similarly I'll have a u2 minus a u2. Just like that. And so obviously the terms in the square brackets are zero and that system is linear. That's it, four steps. Now let's look at another case. It's the mass spring damper system again, but now it has a uh, hardening spring. That's the kh times y cubed. We'll go through the same steps. Linearity, we assume. We substitute those expressions in 8 back into 7, taking a couple derivatives as needed, and we get this expression. And it looks pretty much like the previous one, except we have this nasty looking quantity in square brackets to the, to the third power. You can imagine that's going to cause us some heartburn in just a minute. Well, pretty much right now. So here we're going to regroup. We're going to try to expand that out and break out all the terms that are multiplied by alpha 1 and all the terms that are multiplied by alpha 2. The problem is this cubed expression has alpha 1 cubes and alpha 2 squareds and all sorts of strange things in it. So we're not even going to mess with that. We'll just leave it alone and do the best we can with the alpha 1, alpha 2 uh, regrouping. And now we'll use our original differential equation of equation 7 with the specific u1 and u2 expressions as the inputs, and we get that. And now we could solve this equation for my1 double dot plus cy1 dot minus u1, and that goes into here. And do the same thing for the... Um, uh, this expression, and we get this. This term just carried down to here, and this is the best we can do with our substitutions. So we didn't get the nice cancellation that we had in the previous case. There's no way that this thing is equal to zero in general for any alpha one, alpha two combination. I mean, it is equal to zero if you pick alpha one equals zero and alpha two equals zero. And you can imagine you might be able to find other combinations of alpha one and alpha two such that you can make that zero, but it has to be able to work for any alpha one, alpha two. It's not going to happen. So this thing is nonlinear. Could be a wonderful thing. I don't want to say that linear is better than nonlinear. It just is what it is, but this is nonlinear. So now what we're going to do is play around with some MATLAB Simulink, and we'll use this differential equation model. It's kind of fun. It has the linear stiffness and the nonlinear stiffness, and it has a neat little uh, time-varying damping coefficient. 
So we can really play around with some different uh, scenarios. So for instance, um, if we zero out this k, then we end up with this nonlinear expression. Um, and we can also look at things that we haven't looked at um, in the math by letting c of t be something other than a constant and uh, explore ex at least experimentally, in a sense, simulation-wise, whether or not that system is linear. This is what the model looks like. I'll walk through this when I bring it up. We have some parameters over here, some inputs, and then here's our experiments. Let's get to it. Here's MATLAB. Um, let me bring this up. Here's a little setup script. It has just 12 lines to it. Cleans up the workspace a little bit. Clears out the Simulink Data Inspector. We'll be using that to analyze the results of our quote-unquote experiments. And then here we just set up some parameters, the mass, the stiffness, and the alpha 1, alpha 2. I picked those to be 1 and negative 3, but they could be anything. Now let's have a look at the model. Here it is. On the left, we have the parameters, k, kh, um, and the damping over here. Now, I put a little manual switch in so that we can switch between the ramp looking um, c of t and the constant c right here. And I put a 1 and a 0 gain in here so that we can turn off or on these signals. So for instance, right now, it's in its linear mode. If I switch this to a 1 and that to a 0, it now becomes the nonlinear uh, version. So these are the parameters. And you can see that they drift over here into the experiments. I color coded these. They're called go-to statements. They just let you move data from one place in the model to another without having all these lines crisscrossing. And I color coded them so that they're you know unique. That is, this blue, orange, and red correspond to the blue, orange, red here. So each of these experiments gets the exact same parameters. Here are the inputs. I just pulled these out of the air. I've got a sine wave for u1 and a step for u2. And they are going into experiment one is getting u1. Experiment 2 is getting U2, and experiment 3 is, no surprise, getting the sum of those two multiplied by alpha 1 and alpha 2. And the output or outputs of these experiments are Y1, Y2, and Y3. And then I take Y1 and Y2 and sum them together after multiplying by the alpha 1, alpha 2. So what we're going to be doing in our experimental evaluation here is comparing this Y3 to that y1 plus y2 and seeing if they are equal or not. Now, you might ask yourself, what's inside these experiment blocks? Well, they're all exactly the same. So I can just look at one of them. And it looks like this. Um, this is a MATLAB function, and I'm using it to, to implement the differential equation model of the system. If I click into it, it looks like this. Um, you know, you can play around with that if you want, or if you're familiar with it, you can expand upon it as you see fit. But they really didn't want to get into the, the guts of how that model works, but just suffice it to say that each one of those blocks has associated with it a simulation of that um, differential equation that we had in the notes and it's replicated up here. Okay, let's run this puppy. So we've got it in linear mode with a constant damping. I'm just going to run it. Go into the uh, simulation data inspector. And there's the results. Now I had pre-selected those. Normally it would come up like this. And I went like so. Um, and they match. They match really well. So if I put some cursors on there and move it around, I can see they, you know, 0.05 and 0.05, but if you hover over them, uh, the little boxes, you can see the all the you know guts of that number, and oh my gosh, right on. Okay, very nice. So because Y3 matched with Y1 plus Y2, it's linear. Let's do another one. Um, let's go to the nonlinear case, the one that we looked at in the example just a minute ago. Okay, so I've now made it nonlinear. It's got the constant damping. Run it. 
click on this little data inspector button. Ooh, that's so equal. What this is telling us is that y3 is not equal to y1 plus y2, and so indeed that system is nonlinear. Let's go to, since we didn't look at this in any of the numer or any of the uh, examples, let's go to a non-constant damping and a plain old linear looking stiffness. Now what do you think? Is this nonlinear or linear? So if these match up, then there's a good chance our system is linear. And it looks pretty linear. Okay, that is it. Just to summarize, we looked at superposition and we broke down the determination of differential equation model in terms of its linearity or nonlinearity. We broke that down into four steps. If you do those four steps, a little bit of math, a little bit of algebra, you'll be able to ascertain whether or not your differential equation model is linear or not. Then you can always play around with it a little bit in Simulink or MATLAB or Python or whatever it is, whatever poison you want to use, and uh, get another feel for it. Hope this helps. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.